Hi, this is Statistically Insignificant, the stats podcast with visual aids, which is definitely too cool for school. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she and they, and I will be the statistician on this radio. With me is Bart. Hi, Bart. Hey, how's it going? Um, I go by he and him, and since the last episode, I've read a book about an obscure 1980s uh, video game. And two separate animes I've watched about uh, going to art school. So if you've read the title of this episode, you can imagine my experience in the area. (laughs) We also have our very first guest, Shane Greenwood. How's it going, Shane? I'm going good, thank you. How is everyone? Yeah, good. Shane is a martial arts trainer and co-owner of the Double Dragon Gym in Sutherland, Sydney. He also co-hosts the Combat Chat podcast. He's here to lend his expertise to today's episode about combat sports statistics. We're going to be focusing on boxing because that's the only one I have any real familiarity with. But Shane also trains jiu-jitsu and Muay Thai and MMA, I believe. Yes, I dabble. (laughs) So there are two parts of this that I want to talk about today. The statistics that arise from a particular fight and the statistics that get associated with a fighter, which are usually a summary of fight performance and a couple of other things. To do this, of course, we have to suck all of the fun and excitement out of a fight by reducing it to a system that's being measured. A fight is a very complex thing to try and measure. We can get more granular and look at a particular round, but overall, a fight produces a measurement of win, lose, or draw, overall and for each fighter. There are some other stats we'll talk about later. Boxing has a scoring system and judges who apply it, and if a match is decided on points, i.e. not a knockout or a technical knockout, that's what makes the decision. Shane, can you tell me what the judges look for in scoring a round and how the scoring system works? So, like, a lot of my officiating experiences with Muay Thai, but combat sports is pretty general in terms of the the number one scoring criteria is effective damage. Right. So, that's, yeah, so that's basically, like, a shot that makes a significant impact, um, marks up your opponent, or changes their disposition. Okay. Um, yeah, it's like that, that's usually the, the main scoring ter- criteria. And then, like, you know, boxing, they, they put a high emphasis on, like, you know, how well you defend, so like, further down okay. the category. And, um, and yeah, but that's that's basically the, the, the easiest explanation for people yeah. to watch fights and how to score them. <laughs> yes, and of course, uh, while this is a visual medium, we don't have any fights to actually demonstrate this. So you can so- find heaps on YouTube. Just, just pick one. <laughs> <laughs> So there's two sides to this process. There's the measurement system, which I think for a round is a 10-point system. Yep, 10-point system. Yeah, and then there's the measurement instrument, which is the judge making the determination. So we also have an idea of what I would call measurement error. That's when what a judge scores as effective damage or effective defense doesn't match the reality. We also have a validation process where the judges' scores are compared. So you have three judges... And they will see slightly different things because they're sitting around the bottom of the ring. And they will like probably measure slightly different things in the fight as well as having their own criteria for what that looks like. They don't have perfect information. They can't physically see everything that happens because each one can only see the ring from one direction. They're also seated below the ring. So the audience doesn't have the show blocked, of course. Shane, I believe you've judged a couple of matters. How do you deal with the limitations of what you can see? Well, yeah, you just kind of uh, get what you get. You can either just score what you can see from there, and um, you get a. It's like it's a pretty common thing if you got a, a bunch of friends around. You are watching TV, goes. It's like, oh, how do you see that judge score? See that point? Like you know, it looked it looked completely different because you get to see a lot more angles. So, if usually the, you're going to be on one side of the ring, which is pretty clear, but if they're in the corner, and their backs to you, you might not see the other guy. You know, it might be scoring effectively, and it kind of it just uh, it changes what you perceive of what's happening in the fight. So yeah. you're not you're not allowed to move around as a judge. You have to sit in your seat. Okay, you can't get up or anything like that and have a look around from this. But that that's that's why you got three judges. Um, mm. Some some other combat sports, uh, like more on the kickboxing side of things, have five judges even. Oh damn! So like, in, <laughs> yeah. But you always want an odd number of judges just so you can like you can uh, yeah. render a verdict. Right, so yeah. that's why there's not four judges and one on each side. Yeah, or well, you could get just a lot of draws. Yeah. <laughs> <happening>. <laughs> yeah which, is, which isn't exciting. <laughs> um, so for big fights like um, like 
on TV and stuff. Is there any video review like they have in other sports? Um, th- there is. There sometimes is. Like it depends because there's so many different sanctions. Even within like you know boxing, Muay Thai, there's like you know hundreds of sanctions. So, what there. do you mean by a sanction? So a sanction is like the judging panel. So okay. you got the the promotion. That's like yeah, they have nothing to do with like you know the judges and the refs. They just have, they usually pick a sanction. Let's say like when I used to, I used to, I, I kind of still run a show, Fire in the Shire. We usually go with MTA, which is Muay Thai Australia, and then they pick the judges and the refs for right, that. But okay. I but the, as a promotion, I don't have any influence on how that goes. Right? Is that? Uh theoretically you don't have any influence but as you get to like higher and higher levels of combat sports there will be preferred judges for a particular fighter um like it depends like you know as a, as a promotion you want to like you know probably stick to a certain sanction but it, it, it's also pretty common from on a show to show basis and on terms of, of availability and i don't know conflict of interest yeah <laughs> that's, might, that's the big thing i'm wondering sanctions. about yeah yeah, yeah, it's definitely there's there's a lot of politics that goes into fighting, like I guess any other thing in life. Yeah. So in terms of the differences between the sports that you have dealt with, how does the scoring in something like Muay Thai compare to something like boxing? Well, like same thing. Like the the number one scoring criteria is damage. Mm. Um, but like yeah, they're, they're completely two different sports. Like you can just kind of say, oh, they're just hitting each other, but it's is there's a different tempoing. Um, there's a lot more, just kind of smaller detail things that you kind of pick up that, like, like, let's say a, a boxing judge, I, I don't feel could probably, uh, properly score a Muay Thai fight. Mm. Cause there's a, there's a lot of like little things that go into play in terms of like, you know, the fighter style and if they're employing their style of good and like boxing from there. Same thing with boxing. Some, some judges prefer harder hits, um, opposed to other judges that prefer like, you know, just, uh, the other guy probably hitting the other guy more, but not as hard. Right. So like a, yeah, effective damage again. So yeah, it can be very, it's like, you know, you, you get taught, like this is how you go to school, but then it's very subjective to the judge, judge himself in terms yeah. of like, you know, what he likes to see. Well, that, that's one of the things that's really interesting to me. But just before we get there, MMA is, uh, or U- UFC, I suppose, is a huge thing in like popular culture at the moment. Because it amalgamates a whole bunch of different sports, how do you see the judging change from a single sport to this mixed martial arts field? Well, very complex. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet. <laughs> it's um, like even for myself, like I've watched, I, I've been like a part of MMA for like good, maybe eight, ten years from there. Like I haven't been like in the last few years because like, you know, I really want to focus on Muay Thai. But like our gym used to like house like a fair few good like MMA fighters though, mm. like you know, nationally ranked and, and went to the UFC, but um, but yeah, it's just, it's it's a hard spot to call because like you know, there's like many different rule sets depending on the region that you go to, yeah. like um, like Oceania region or like you go to Americas, like that, <clears throat> and then and then it's the same thing. It just kind of goes into what what is uh, what do you think is a high score criteria? Is it the guy that probably spent the majority of the round controlling the other person, like, you know, pinning them on the ground, taking positions, but not kind of damaging up too much. Or do you, if the other guy was up only for a second, but scored some big damage in that, in yeah. that like short amount of time, does that score more? So, well, well, also, like, I imagine because there are so many different fighting styles that go into MMA, what what do the judges do with that? Like, do they themselves have enough of a variety of experience and knowledge in judging these different sports to do that effectively? Or is it common to have, like, a judge who's a specialist in something like a striking sport or a um, wrestling, and they are better equipped to judge those parts of the far more complex fight? I'm not too sure. Like, I, okay. I don't think I could I comment, comment it, uh, like, too surely because, like, it's like, I'm, like I said, I'm not really part of that industry in the last five years but i remember back before it's like you really you got what you got yeah like you know sometimes just a boxing co- a boxing judge would just have to fill in mm. and like you know it's, and he probably knows nothing of the ground game so <laughs> so like you know he just goes oh the guy that was standing up hitting he won yeah well yeah. like there's there's millions of other things happening on the ground yeah for sure yeah. Mm-hmm. so yeah. while we're on the topic of judging what are some really egregious mistakes you've seen judges make 
in, in terms of judging, oh, like you just see, I don't know, like I, I was even watching like uh, Rebellion Muay Thai last night. Like that's the premier uh, promotion in, in Australia and like mm. probably the Oceania region. That's in Melbourne. Um, like I was watching a fight last night, uh, Carter Lawrence versus Darren Chen. And I felt like it, it ended up being a split point draw, which is like one judge gave it to Carter, mm. another judge gave it to Darren Chen, and the uh, the last judge actually scored a, a, a draw. Oh. He fought like you know, he couldn't split him, so that's what a split draw is. So, you know, you got one person on either side, and then just a person in the middle that just goes, ah, oh, I can't, I can't. Decide. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I was watching that, and I was going, and then I fought like Carter. And I was going, man, it's like this. Is you know, <laughs> bullshit yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's like, i don't know if i could swear or anything like no that. i'll, I'll <laughs> go like, for your life like okay yeah, yeah but then 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 i go this i woke up this morning and i just go oh, i gotta watch this again but i watch it without the commentary yeah right and then and then now i go oh actually i scored it for darren by one round ah. so so that's so even like you know things like um there's like some really atrocious decisions sometimes in all combat sports but mm. But sometimes yourself, you you got to like look at it again and take out some influences because like the commentary, like I didn't realize how much it influenced me, but it actually swayed my judgment. But then when I actually looked at the fight without the commentary, I saw the, the smaller stuff where I go, okay, I can see why. Mm. Like, you know, the other guy won it, might want it. Well, in that front, does the crowd kind of have an influence on what is considered... I guess, well, we'll get to the more detail on this, but what is considered, like, really good play if the crowd gets roused up by it? Oh, most definitely. Like, if you ever seen me corner a fighter, it's like, I'm the I'm the loudest dude in the room. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, like, every time, like, in Muay Thai, you, it's like, you don't get it much in boxing. Boxing is like, it's, it's almost weird to me. It's very quiet. You just hear mm. people just kind of smacking each other around. But in, in Muay Thai, it's very common, like, if your fighter scores, you go, Oi! It's, oh, right, it's, it's yeah. An, it's actually a nothing word. It's not a tie word or anything. It's just like just a yeah, noise yeah. that you're signifying that you scored, and you're actually letting the judges know, "Hey, did you see that? My guy, yeah, right, like, you know, did did the good work there." So mm-hmm. yeah, so uh, yeah, crowds and that have a big influence on judges, and but most of the time, really experienced judges don't let that you know sway them. Yeah, I was gonna say, I imagine that becomes you become less and less impressionable as you uh, get more and more experienced in it. Mm-hmm, definitely. So of these things we've talked about here, the effective damage for scoring and how well you defend, I really want to talk about the idea of a scoring strike or effective damage, because to my eye, this has a really like complex and subjective measurement process. You've already just talked about how indicating to a Muay Thai judge that you saw something might sway them just a little, even if they don't necessarily think so. Mm. So it's all, so it's a lot more than just making contact. So if we have a strike, let's say we have... Fighter A punches, but it could be a kick or an elbow or whatever. B, right? But we also have Judge C over here observing. So Judge C is the person who classifies the strike as effective uh, damage or not. I, I know that the term significant strike shows up, but that seems to be slightly different to this. And also, I am very hesitant to use the word significant as anything other than a stupid joke and a podcast name. But this process isn't really a discrete one. Some amount of force, let's say somewhere between, oh, butterfly kiss and a sledgehammer, gets applied to B by A either head, body, whatever. This is a continuous range, right? There's no strict threshold here where it stops being something that isn't very effective to something that is effective. Let's say that the force lies somewhere here in the middle, like halfway between your butterfly kiss and your sledgehammer, right? The physiology of fighter B's reaction comes into play too. The same amount of force applied to a 50 kilogram fighter will have a very different response compared to a 100 kilogram fighter. So the threshold at which the observer, C, would say something is a scoring strike probably depends a lot on the fighters involved too. How much fighter B reacts to the blow will come into play, like if they fold themselves around a body strike as a way of getting away from the force of the blow, would that still look like they are being hit harder than they actually are? What do you mean by fold around? So if you imagine uh, somebody punching you in like in the kidneys or like the liver. So this is low on your side of the, of your side of your abdomen, right? You can kind of pull your body out of the way by twisting your abdomen to the side, shoulder and hip go the other direction. 
So you kind of diffuse a bit of the force of the blow by um, moving your your torso out of the way. All right, yeah. But at the same time, if you've been hit really fucking hard, that's probably going to look similar because the force of the blow is going to displace your abdomen the same direction. So I I think, Shane, you mentioned, what was it? There was a recent quite big fight where one of the fighters was doing this sort of thing all over the place, but it looked sloppy or something like that. Um, Oh, God. I cannot remember the name for the life of me. <laughs> but their, their their defensive technique was not necessarily to dodge or deflect, but kind of to absorb some of the M&G by moving. And I was wondering if that can kind of distract from the actual effectiveness of a blow. Yeah, I've, <clears throat> it's a term called like, you know, oh, like to roll with the punch. Yeah, that's or, the one. So like, yeah, so if you kind of eat the punch full on, you like you're going to wear a lot of the shot because it's just a big shock. To yeah. your body, um, but if you kind of move with the punch from it, you can kind of dissipate the force that's going to get transferred into you off of that. Mm. Um, probably like not the the best medical explanation. Yeah, for no, no. There. But <laughs> so if if a judge is watching that, is it easy to tell the difference between those two? Uh, uh, if you're sitting ringside, it's probably very hard to tell at times. Yeah, depending on your on your angle. Definitely. It's like, yeah, so, 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 so yeah, some people that, yeah, are good at rolling with punches from there. But to, uh, uh, to you, you go, it looks like, dude, man, that, it looks like that guy just got his head snapped back. Yeah, right. Yeah. So like going to before, like where you're sitting on the on the judges, uh, on the, whatever side of the ring, your perspective of fight what you see might be different than the what the judge is seeing on the other side. Mm. So I guess that's one of the things where uh, like having these multiple judges does kind of come into play because one might see that a little better than the others. Although I guess not every strike... or well, The scoring system isn't so much a matter of counting every strike. So how that looks over like a 12-round fight could behave quite differently if one person has just <clears throat> taken less damage because they've been moving out of the way. So you've got this measurement instrument, which is C, observing fighter B's reaction to the blow. You don't have a pressure sensor at the point of impact to tell you the physical reality of how much force has been applied. That information is hidden. You have to judge how much force, how much damage, based on the reaction and what you see in the glove as it hits. To my eye, the factors involved in the scoring hit are how much force is applied, the fighters who struck reaction, the whether the judge sees the strike, so judge vision, and whether the judge considers the strike to have enough force to count. We'll call this judge judgment. What this means is that a particular punch being classified as a scoring shot or not is unreliable, let's say, vibes-based. There's so many factors at play over many fights with different people making these measurements, being the judges, and even across different rounds in the one fight, you'll get a more reliable statistic that you can use to compare to others, because large amounts of fuzzy data can still give you something okay. Though I am interested to hear from you, Shane. How does scoring punches vary over the course of a 12-round fight? So when you're scoring, like, for, for damage and that, so, you yeah, you're looking for the impact, like, you know, if it's, it's a very jarring shot or not. Is it clean on the body or head? Um, also, over the 12 rounds, you can see... The marks on the person's body, yeah, which right. is some, which is sometimes hard because like you get some some pasty people that just mark up, and you just bump into them. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's me. Yep. <laughs> or you get someone that's a little bit more of complexion like me, and like the marks won't come up as much. So it's, mm. it's part of it, but it, it shouldn't be like um, the be all and end all of it. Yeah, it's not a reliable metric. Yeah, yeah, and you get... scoring. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and you and you also get some people from there that just like just in general like you you might get them hidden around the eye and they just puff up straight away even mm. though they might have been winning the whole fight but they look like mincemeat compared to the other guy so yeah yeah so right. that, that's just, it's only a small part that that one that's about that's about it. oh yeah and also if the shot um changes their disposition so if you hit them and it like moves them yeah or right. like you know folds them over as you were talking before um Clean that. That's also a way to indicate if it's a good shot. Is that more likely? So, if we have a, a blow with the same amount of force in round two as compared to round twelve, 
it, given that you will be worn down, you will have taken presumably a number of other blows, is it more likely to affect you later on in the fight for the same amount of force? Yeah, it's, it's like, you know, uh, by that time you're a lot more fatigued. You, your your reactions will be most likely down as well from the fatigue. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's like, you know, everything just sucks a bit more when you're tired, doesn't it? <laughs> oh God, doesn't it ever, yes. Just like you just you just your general resilience just kind of just depletes, <laughs> mm. but but yeah definitely definitely if you if you're hitting with the same force into in, into the last round twelve like kudos you're an animal, um, <laughs> and but but yeah but usually the guy receiving the shot like yeah the, it, you'll see it definitely I I seen it in a lot of fights where it does it definitely does affect them a lot more they take the shot worse like the yeah. You know, they hunch over, they'll take deep breaths after every shot from there. And then like, and, and also a lot of times as well, it will dissuade the person from re-engaging, like, you know, trying to get it back or carry yeah, the right. shot. So is there a um, standard number of points that can be issued each round or does it kind of uh, mm-hmm. change from round to round? Generally, um, I'll, I'll go like, yeah, boxing or Western scoring from there because uh, Muay Thai can be different. And there's other ones that kind of have open scoring where you just make a winner at the end of the fight. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so you so it's on the ten point must system. So the winner gets ten. Um, this is in a whoever, particular round. Yep, in a particular round. And if the, the winner gets nine points, um, if so, they get a knock, so the sorry. winner gets ten and the loser gets nine. Yes. Okay. Yep. And if there's a knockdown. So that's like, you know, if they get knocked down. That's, so just usually for boxing, if your glove touches the ground, that's considered a knockdown. Right. From, if, say, if, from, a, from another person's punch. If you slip over and fall, that's not a knockdown. But if the guy punched you, and even if he like didn't rock you and you just lost balance and you touched your hand on the ground or knee on the ground, that's considered a knockdown. Right. And the referee will issue you an eight count from there and then go. And then if he deems you good to go, you'll keep fighting. Um, so for every knockdown, it's one less point. Okay. So... So if, if I had like winning fighter gets 10 and the losing fighter that also got a knockdown, Would he will eight. have eight, eight points. Okay. But if the winning fighter got knocked down, does that mm-hmm. apply as well? Yeah, it can be. It's like you can have a really dominant round and like, you know, let's say you're winning like a bit. So it, usually uh, boxing is three minute rounds. So if you're winning like, say, I don't know, like two minutes and 50 seconds of that fight pretty comfortably. And in the last 10 seconds, the other guy knocked you down. From there, uh, it could be a nine-nine round. Yeah, right. So, yeah. so you both get points, but it can also be like the other guy, person goes, "Oh, he probably did more effective damage," so it could go the other way. But <clears throat> yeah, would, there's definitely been nine-nine rounds before. Is would there be a nine-eight round? Uh, nine-eight round. Yeah, there must have. Been, uh, there could be definitely. Okay. Um, yeah, there, there would have been a lot of action in that in that round. Right. Okay, but there there isn't like somebody has to get ten points to show that they won. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, definitely not. Okay. Um, yeah, because like so it's usually straight away if you get a knockdown, either five they get you a, a points uh, a subtracted. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. So just before we get off strikes, I mentioned before the term significant strikes. This seems to be more of a thing in MMA. It seems to be that significant strikes are strikes that are not jabs. So they're also called like um, power shots or something like that. I've seen it as other terms. So a jab for the people who haven't punched people in the face before is your usually non-dominant hand, which is usually forward of your of the rest of your body. It's a relatively light shot. You use it to work out how far away the other person is from you to distract them, to get in the way. It's not a power shot in the sense that it doesn't have as much force as a straight punch from your other hand coming from slightly further away and with slightly more force behind it. Is there anything else that goes into considering something a significant strike? Um, Well, you you can, the uh, the jab can be a significant strike. Like if, you know, you kind of step into it, into it hard or if they walk onto it and, you know, they, they put the force onto it. So... Yeah, so the jab, like, you know, jab can, especially in boxing, it's um, it's used lots. It's, like, probably one of the most used punched in boxing. But you can use it as uh, to win rounds also. Mm. Yeah. So <clears throat> so it doesn't have to be, like, you know, always just, like, um, ultra high shots or big swinging shots to hit from there. If the jab is, like, you know, pretty much keeping their place, changing their distribution, marking up, up a bit, 
it definitely can score. Mm. Um, and, um, and I'm just talking from a judge's position from there. Like, uh, it, it, if it goes into, like, say, the, the compu box thing, which, like, you know, records strikes thrown and strikes landed. Yeah. Um, and that's only with big promotions. Like, that's, that's not common, like, on regional scenes or even, even some of the smaller promotions around the world. Um, I don't know if it goes into those numbers, but... We've actually got uh, something from CompuBox later on, so we can tease it apart and complain about it in a little while. (laughs) I did want to ask, though, so what does effective defense mean? So effective defense is the ability to block or evade a shot. So, like, you know, to limit your damage. So so let's say, like, I got... You got one guy there who's absolutely teeing off on another person, uh, but it's all on the guard. So, so that the guard yeah. being like the hands that are raised to yep, protect so yourself. Yeah, so your arms, your gloves, your shoulders. So there, so it's, it's not hitting me on the head or body. Yep. You might be throwing really hard shots. Like you might throw like ten of them from there, and then but I come back and I hit him clean with one shot that really uh, that uh, that hit him on the bottom. Um, so I would win that exchange. Right. So you could right. you could hit the guard all you want pretty pretty hard, and if it's not really changing my disposition, thing, uh, things like that, and then I come back with a, a clean score, you can that's effective defense. Like none of your shots mattered, and uh, like even though you threw a lot more of them, and I threw one back, but it was effective. So I went, I like so I'm I'm probably up on that round in, for the judges' eyes. Right. So over over a longer fight, though, I can imagine that it wears you down to take a lot of shots on the guard as well. Hmm. Yeah. You, it's like everything you have to absorb a bit in the arms yeah. it's same thing with, with Muay Thai I like to say all the time is you can wear shots in the arm that that's like you know it's a still that's a scoring technique in Muay Thai as well because imagine if someone took a baseball bat and just hit a home run straight on your arm yeah it would, it would suck feels like. <laughs> yeah it's like, also it's no like, one is being kicked in the arm <laughs> yep um, but you might also, also block it as well so you, uh, in Muay Thai you can check a kick which is using your own knee and shin to block their kick right also um that's effective defense but it still fucking hurts yeah (laughs) you're just lucky you got you just got lucky you're lucky you just got a lot of adrenaline um when you're fighting so you don't notice it at the time but there's been many uh many ice shinned after fights yeah (laughs) at some point surely the nerve damage just numbs everything right (laughs) <laughs> ah, it's like it, yeah, nah, it still hurts. Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's just, Fair enough. It's just, y- your shins just get harder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So if you've got um, so catching stuff on the guard, the alternative, I suppose, is to have somebody hitting air. Are you more likely to be considered defending effectively if you can dodge or slip or move in such a way that they don't even land on the guard? Yep, definitely. If it doesn't land, it doesn't count. Okay. So, of all the stats to come out of a particular fight, uh, I think knockout is the most clearly defined. It kind of either happens or it doesn't. Like, has there ever been a contentious knockout decision? Um, well, uh, if, if it's like a... like a This is distinct from TK, TKO. Yeah. yeah, okay, yeah. I can't really remember one off the top of my head. There might have been, but generally if it's like a knockout, whereas he's rendered unconscious or he, he can't make the count, that, that actually, yeah, that's, that's probably where it's at. So in boxing and that, if you are unconscious and the referee deems you can't continue, that's a knockout. And also if you cannot um, answer the count, which is you see the referee going like, you know, when they're knocking down, they're going one, two, they've got 10 seconds yeah, right. to get, get up on their feet and show they're competent to fight continue but there is like the times where like you probably see on tv where the guy kind of gets up might be a little bit wobbly and then you see the referee just go nah wave yeah. it off and then uh, straight afterwards yeah. the guy's protesting um <laughs> it's I, I, what what most people don't see in that fact is uh, when you're judge uh, when you're refing you're looking constantly in in the eyes of the fighter yeah and if they're and if they're going like ten different directions each each eye independently from each other, even though he might be standing right, then you just know he's just he's just not there, and he, he the won't be able to defend himself. In. <laughs> yes, yeah. So like that, yeah. So it can be contentious. Um, but there's a from, there's a, a strong medical basis for that decision point to be made. Yeah, yeah. Like for all the fights that I've been a part of, which is pretty lucky, I've associated myself with a really reputable. R and J's as they call like ref and judging mm. uh, sanction. Uh, <clears throat> that like yeah, I, I've I've never seen really a contentious one happen in front of me. 
Yeah, right. So in distinct from that, a technical knockout, a TKO. So this is when the referee makes a call that one fighter is unable to continue, but they're not unconscious or they're not having this like head going all over the place stuff. What mm-hmm. sort of decisions go into that? Um, so things like cuts. Yeah, right. So if you get cut, like usually if you get cut above the eye and it's like, you know, it's dripping into your eye and it's impeding your vision. So the doctor usually makes that call. Mm. So he'll, he'll tell the, he'll tell the ref, like, okay, this guy, this cut's too bad. He can't continue. That's a TKO. Um, there's also from, uh, injury as well. So let's say I throw a punch and dislocate my shoulder. Yeah, right. Yeah. So that can be also like, um... It can be different in other places, but as I've been kind of taught that if we're in a fight and basically if I injure myself, then I lost. Yeah, okay. So, so even if I dislocate my own shoulder, then basically I go, yep, other guy won. Because yeah. that's, that's Well, it's a better idea to stop at that point than try to continue, I guess. Yeah. I think what most of goes into there is people uh, argue that it should be a no contest. Yeah, right. Yeah, opposed to a TKO. Yeah. But, but like, you know, what happens in the fight happens in the fight. You know, it's like, you know, but going on from that, the other one is as well, if, if one person is just getting absolutely like towed up, outclassed, has no chance of really turning it around, but they're not, they might not even, like, they might have got knocked down, they might not got knocked down, but the referees is like, you know, just, just waves off, just goes, this guy's taking way too much damage. He's too yeah. tough for his own good. We're just going <laughs> to let him fight another day. So is there ever a strategy when it comes to like fighting somebody to try and go for blows that would potentially cause the TKO so like hitting specifically above the eye if you can actually manage such a thing I don't know how precisely one can call shots like that in order to hope that you open up a cut there yeah you, this is going into like uh more of the coaching realm and like yeah strategizing a little bit if, if you're in the process there's probably a lot of tape on the person you're fighting and you, if you notice they cut easily they probably, if they had a lot of cuts in their careers, they usually got a lot of scar tissue Yeah, right. around that region from there. And yeah, you can like, you can definitely strategize to kind of try to open up cuts. Um, it's, a, it's a lot harder in boxing. Mm. Muay yeah. Thai is not that hard. You just throw elbows in people's faces and then... <laughs> <laughs> yep. It's like, and then it's like, you know, it's like ripping, ripping apart like wet paper. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, yeah. So if they got a lot of scar tissue from there, it means that like, the, not the actual scar stuff, but the skin around it, Will will tear easier a lot mm. of the times. So yeah, you can definitely strategize for that. Okay, with respect to injuries that might stop a fight, I have seen a couple of instances where boxers have said after a fight that they had broken their hands and just continued. What's the go with that? Like hand injuries, foot injuries, that sort of thing. Um, well, uh, while the fight's going on, that's that's up to the fighter in the corner to make the decision. When when the fight's going on, you, you usually have a lot of adrenaline running. So you might not notice these things, but like you might just go, oh, I can't use this hand. Like it's just got no power in it. Or it, if it's really, really broken, you, you'll probably notice it, but you know, you come to your corner and then just go, my hand's broken. And then coach will be like, goes, well, what do you want to do then? Do you want right. to keep fighting or not fighting? And then it's really up to the corner then to decide. And, and like I'll tell you right now, as fighters, They'll keep fighting. Yeah, they, <laughs> yeah they, I can they, imagine. They, Particularly very, at like pro level. Yeah, they very rarely give up, and then and then especially with some fighters as well. Like you get paid per round, right? So if you're like two rounds into an eight round fight, and that, that and the guy broke his hand, he goes, "Fuck, I need this paycheck, man." It's like you know, I'll, yeah. I'll fight with one hand. It's like you know, and I'll just try and defend. He, he'll probably go into a mode where it's just more self preservation, where he's not going to try and win. It's like he he probably thinks it's too hard to win. He'll just kind of just. What keep himself safe as long enough. As possible. Yeah, and just at the end of the day, just go on, just get that paycheck. So if if well, I guess if we bring up kind of material conditions of fighter for a second, if it's paid per round, what happens if there's a knockout in round three? Well, it, uh, that goes in, into the promoter now. So okay. the promoter can like say, hey, like you know, hey, you can have a knockout bonus. You can have all that money because <laughs> it's like it's always good for highlights and it's good for your own marketing yeah right um, and then some promoters probably just go like yeah um, yep you fought three rounds here's your free round pay that's what was in the contract Gen- generally though if it was like a knockout from there the most promoters go ah you can have it all of it okay. that's okay yeah but like but knowing just the combat sport industry and notice 
there's like not always good elements in there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I would bite phrase it as ruthlessly exploitative, but uh... yeah, it, it is. There's like this. There's no fighters union, so <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe there should be. Although I can imagine uh, trying to set that up would come at a great deal of personal risk. Well, it's really a lot of times it's on the fighters themselves to band together and do it. Like you know, I'm I'm all for it. Like yeah, yeah. These, these guys need to be looked after. But at the end of the day, the fighters will. They go, oh yeah, you should get the union. Uh, you know, you should get the union going. Get the union going, and then, then the promoter goes. Promoter goes, oh, but I'll give you this money if you don't. He goes, okay, I'm gonna take this money instead. You know, and, <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, that's that's not exactly unusual in trying to unionize any workplace. Yeah, exactly. But especially in industries where people are individually competing each, with each other, it's gonna yeah. be more difficult to unionize than most workplaces where you are at the same level and are not necessarily competing with each other, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and look, look. mostly, aside from, you know, caring about the fighters themselves, I would be really keen to see a literally militant union out there. That'd be amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Bring them along to a strike and you'll have no trouble. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> so my next question is, I guess, a really big one. There are different styles of boxing. Just... Let's talk about boxing on its own, because advancing beyond there, of course, complicates everything. How does a judge compare the effectiveness of a fighter who is a slugger, someone who doesn't throw a lot of punches but is a heavy hitter when they do, to a swarmer, which is a style that does throw a lot of punches and seeks to overwhelm the opponent's defense, or any other combination of styles? For boxing, same thing. It's like, I'm just going to go more so of my experience, which is the boxing, like, yep. showing is not that much. Okay, so like people listening to this one, like don't don't fucking get at me in my DMs. Tell me, oh, you're, <laughs> you did this. Like, I'm I'm just going like well, from my own experience from there. It might not be quite right, but I think it's generally in the ballpark. Um, so you got to look at like yeah. So once you get to this point, as a judge, you, you got to know who's fighting, especially in the pro level, and especially you, like you know if you're a judge, you probably judge them since they're an amateur and mm. and going forward, and you just like you just know people on the scene. So you go into like who was more effective in um, enforcing their style. Right. So if you've got like an outside fighter, usually those kind of tall rangy guys, they're probably not as powerful. But if he's just out there just kind of popping jabs away, like we said before, not might be strong, but and he's fighting some uh, fighting a slugger or a puncher, but the guys just swinging there, chasing him around the ring, can't pin him down, might get a few good shots, but generally just probably just getting outworked mm. and that. So, I'll, I'll, yeah, you'd lean towards the, the guy. Most of the time, you'll lean to the guy that was just doing more more effective work. So that to go, that goes into now, like, you know, effective damage. But if the other guy's just doing so much more work and landing, but not as hard as the other guy from there, you just got to think about where where was the majority in the round, where, where the foot, where, where the fight took place, and who was controlling controlling uh, that, that round through it. Mm. I certainly have heard comments from fighters that they've found um, flighty people or people who like to move around a bit very difficult to deal with because it's mm-hmm. kind of hard to impress what you want to do on somebody who's just not there. Yeah, exactly. It's um, it's probably easier. Than, uh, like It's probably a little bit... It, oh, no, it's not easy. That's not the right word. Like you, you, probably, you got more time to work a game plan out in boxing if it's a 12 round fight. Yeah. Yeah, as opposed to like Muay Thai, it's like five rounds, so. Right, and amateur fights are three? Yeah, three, that's just. That's, that's no just time at all. Yeah, no, you, just, you, just, you just get in and swing amateurs, that's <laughs> Yeah, it's the, like, the few amateur fights that I have seen seem to really reward that sort of swarmer style. Mm. But but it's different though. Like if you look on the Olympic level, if you watch the Olympic boxing, I thought it was I thought it was some really good guys there that that pick more kind of single shots. Like uh, you can kind of swarm and try and hit in volume, but mm. then like most of the guys that actually won the medals were the guys not throwing as much, but they were p- picking huge scores that the judges can see and then disengaging. Right. So, yes. Right. Mm-hmm. So, so they say that one shot they hit really clean and then they didn't stay in there too long for the other guy they hit him back a couple of times they just kind of boom hit and move well to my eye that a lot of what's being demonstrated there is control so mm. the ability to say okay now is when i want to move in and attack and like that well i guess it's having a, a strategy that you can implement is that's the stylistic aspect 
Yeah, definitely. I, I think to kind of implement your style, it, it, it favors boxing a lot, uh, a lot more with the more rounds. Mm. But but that's saying that as well, like in Muay Thai, you can do it. You just have to, you just have to, pretty much, get it going a bit earlier and really kind of like, like yeah. um, dominate whatever the distance you want to cre- uh, have the fight at. Right. So it, with that, in comparing the twelve rounds to the five. Does it also mean that you can, in fact, expend a lot more energy per round in five in five rounds, and you don't so much have to play a long game and get used to somebody, and then, and the later rounds kind of come in and try to overwhelm them? Yeah, definitely. If it's shorter rounds, it probably favors the guy that's got more power. Because mm. uh, if you're if you're a lot more powerful fighter, like you know, you generate a lot of energy in your punches from there. It's like uh, over a longer period of time that that power will not most of the time won't last or it's just very it's very draining on your ga- gas tank yeah while someone that doesn't throw as hard will be able to throw more it probably favor them the more rounds there are there are because there are they're they're just more they because of their lesser power input uh, output there they, but they can keep it up for a longer duration of time yeah. so i imagine that a lot of um well slugger style or the more kind of power punching style would aim for knockouts or similar yeah, definitely. Um, I guess Mike Tyson is a good example of that. <laughs> yes. It's like um, you can see most of these fights finished within six rounds, but then the ones that went past that didn't really didn't really win them. Didn't didn't go past like you know didn't go the distance a lot of times. Mm. Um, but like a, a, off memory serves, I think if the times that he did go distances, he he didn't go very good. Was yeah, he right. in the era of uh, fifteen round fights? Or had they already changed it to twelve by that time? Well, mm, interesting. Um, I, I, I don't. Oh, he might have been. It's like I think he was still in the. I think it was in the twelve round era. I don't yeah. think it was in the fifteen round era. But, yeah. but then, like, it, and that might have been the start of his career because, like, the start of his career, man, he only needed like less than five rounds. <laughs> well, yes, I suppose if you never get to the fifteen rounds, it's kind of much of a muchness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I think the fifteen rounds was like probably the era just before him, like. Uh, George Foreman, Muhammad yeah. Ali, like that. Like yeah, for, right. for myself, like I, I'd rather just have boxing be eight rounds. It's, it's like you know. It's oh really? So is that um, is that a local thing or is it? Oh, uh, like you, you, like you know. So twelve rounds isn't always standard, right? For boxing, like a a title fight is um, depending on the title. I've seen title fights for ten rounds, mm. yeah, but generally, like you see the big big fights at the top of the division fights, like world titles, they're they're always standard twelve. Um, but like local boxing matches, like pros, like you can start at six rounds, eight okay. rounds. Yeah. So you don't have to go straight into tens or twelves from there. That's the same thing. That's a negotiating thing as well. You can have with, uh, between the promoter and your opponent, especially when you're first starting off. Yeah. So with that, just before we get on to other things, with the duration of a fight, like o- over a career, somebody doing like six or eight round fights do they tend to wind up with fewer injuries few less long-term problems than somebody doing 12 or 15 hmm um you i realize so. that may be very difficult to tell <laughs> yeah it's like yeah i don't really don't really have any data on that myself mm. uh i don't think many people i don't, I don't even know if there's anyone doing any kind of research on that but mm. you'd think because of like the less amount of time the less impact even kind of like you know like um well, yeah, but there's that like, trade-off between how many rounds you have and how much energy you can expend in each. Yes. But I guess like there's also the limiting factor of if you've got five three-minute rounds, there's just less time to be hit. Mm. Yeah. Yes, yeah, no, that's right. I, I agree with that. Mm. Um, I, th- I think with like injuries and like you know concussions and like you know they're doing a lot more look into CTE. It's um, it's more so like how you train is a bigger impact. Oh, really? So. Yeah, it's especially like old school boxing gyms, um, like they'll they'll spar. Like, and I, I heard this from like people that went over to America. It seems like a very American thing as well compared to Australia and and Europe, and that they'll spar like four or five times a week. And this, but the sparring is if you get knocked out, you get picked back up again, and oh. you shake it off. You shake it off, and you go straight back in. Right, so it's it's just it. compounding injuries, really. 
yeah, it's fucking stupid. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I'm, yep. I'm definitely not not in the ca- case of that. Like, if we, I, like, for our I own guys, we I couldn't tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. Our, our guys, like, you know, we train, like, we spar a, a fair bit each week, but, like, it's very, like, you know, limited, like, you know, limited intensity or scenario based. And then, then once a week, we have, like, a bit, a little bit more harder sparring, especially with the guys that f- are fighting. But it's never, like, there's never intent to knock each other out. Yeah, and right. If someone, yeah. If someone, if it's, and like in the gym, I've probably only seen like maybe one or two knockouts in in the space of me being there for like fifteen years. Mm. Yeah, yeah, right. and like, and most of the time, it's like the other guy just kind of running onto a shot he wasn't expecting. It wasn't like the other guy Intending punching was to like, do it. yeah, yeah, going for going for him. Yeah. So, with respect to that, I, I imagine that one of the kind of philosophical underpinnings of this is if you have the like. Uh, full force fighting with the intent to knock out even if you don't necessarily pick up somebody and put them back in the ring after being knocked out you get a lot more exposure to what it's like to fight under those conditions whereas Mm. if you were fighting in the kind of um less intense sort of style you could potentially do a lot more sparring so there's this kind of trade-off between exposure to high intensity and exposure to more Mm. yeah it's with the intensity thing, like I, I'm, I'm like I'm always. My philosophy is like you know, the ability to do more, you're gonna get better. Mm. Like with, with any skill, you can like you know you can try and skip steps or cut corners by picking the intensity up, and it works for a bit. But like everything, like the more intensity you have, the quicker you'll burn out. Mm. And and same thing, and if the intensity is high all the time, and I've seen it before, like the, you know I've got to train hard every day. Or something like that, you know, fucking no restos here, bro. Like that kind of, that kind of. That, <laughs> That's you know, just kind of, asking for injury, really. Yeah, yeah, you know, just you know, general that just Instagram bullshit, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. but like, yeah, it's like, it's like you just, you know, I just send it too much. You just burn out. You can't keep that up, man. It's like it, it's like literally, like, it's it's like how I imagine a soldier being. Yeah. You're in war every day, the stress level is so high, and then you just basically men- mentally you just break down. You just can't keep that up. You know, it's. it's uh, your body's just not meant to deal with that level of stress all the time from recovering from preparing to go into session if you, if you have to like if you have to sit down in your car and fucking and like fucking meditate for 10 minutes or breathe just to get in the gym from there then like there's something wrong <laughs> that's, an, that's, uh, that's an anxiety disorder I'm familiar with that actually <laughs> yeah like but if that's like you like you know for a like, constant thing like you know yeah especially for people fighting it's, it's just not healthy because you, you just won't be able to keep it up mm. yeah All right, let's get on to some of the other statistics taken from fights. These are more for the audience rather than the judges. There are a bunch of companies which do stats reporting on fights. Some of them even offer live updates, which we'll talk about. CompuBox seems to be the biggest one for boxing, yes? Uh, Yeah, seems the most well-known one, yes. Okay, so they put out stats on a fight that look like this. Uh, we mentioned, well, if I wasn't throwing my pen all over the place, so we mentioned this uh, sort of jab versus power punches division previously. So are these what would be considered st- uh, significant strikes? Uh, yes. Right. So does this distinction here put like a power jab into power punches or is it all lead hand shots are jabs? Interesting. I'm not, I'm not too sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah. They Look, they're not unless you're willing to pay a lot of money, they don't seem to be very forthcoming with that sort of information, which is why I was hoping you knew, because I couldn't <laughs> yeah. find out. Oh, uh, yeah, it's just, it seems to be very subjective. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, uh, yeah, but, like, yeah, I don't know, uh, Jabs Land, I guess that's where we were talking about before, like, you know, the between the butterfly kiss and the sledgehammer kind of yeah. scale there. Like, you know, you can, like, you know, like I said, throw like a really stiff jab, but it, then, like, is it then is it a jab or is is that like a lead hand cross like yeah right you know, getting, yeah, that, getting in the weeds there <laughs> it, well i mean it's a little bit more continuous than it looks when you mm-hmm. first start i suppose yeah and like particularly if people are throwing messy punches I, I imagine it can get really hard to work out if it was a particular type of punch or not mm-hmm. yeah it's like I, i'm always like uh when you watch these fights some, sometimes they have a, um, like live updates doing it and I, I just 
I just yeah. don't know how you can, how, how you can do it live because I'm, you know, I go, do you really? It's like, it's, it's, I don't know if the, how accurate those numbers are. But oh, they usually... we'll get to that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I imagine they change after a day or so of like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, in this fight, actually, Julian Williams won. So one of the things I can notice here is that if we just come down to this final punch stats report, Julian didn't throw as many punches, but he had a higher landing rate i don't know do you know these fighters this was a 2019 fight do you know how that might correspond to style mm. i realize that i'm just asking you for two people out of the blue but uh... <laughs> <laughs> uh, i know jared heard okay yeah jared heard's a good fighter for that one okay uh, julian williams not so familiar all right but do you think that heard is more of a volume fighter he y- can be he can be okay. he's like he- yeah because I'm just looking at this 800 here. That's a lot of punches to be throwing. Mm. Like, bloody hell. <laughs> uh, so I was... And, like, even on... So that's total. So that's everything. And he also threw more jabs uh, in particular. But, again, hit fewer of them. So that, to me, throwing more and hitting fewer is not even... Not just indica- indicative of somebody who's losing a fight, but also more of that sort of swarmer style. Mm. So in in the bigger fights, CompuBox or some other companies will provide a live update of stats. Then after the fact, they have people go through the fight and watch it in slow motion to recount the punches thrown and landed. They generally need to. Uh, Live stats in these fights are known to be inaccurate because everything moves so fast and it's very difficult to judge what's going on in the moment. This is an interesting thing where you can kind of have these judges operating at a slightly higher level where they are not trying to count how many strikes somebody's had they have slightly more abstracted metrics for how effective their attacking is or how effective their defending is whereas these statistics are are very much they are trying to count every single strike or or like and that's a very different measurement process to the judges on another website uh boxstat.co they claim that they count and i quote here Count every, each and every punch from post-fight video playback so there is no room for error with our punch stats. I'm sorry, buddy. I hate to break it to you. That's not how measurement works. <laughs> Everything has error, and you can either admit that and account for it or pretend otherwise and be wrong all the time. So, because I am a slightly rapid leftist, I have to ask the question of why these stats are chosen, why they're constructed this way. The score within a fight is to determine the fight outcome, but stuff like punches thrown in live updates, that's not used by the judges. Shane, as a trainer or as a fighter, would you ever look at this sort of thing on opponents that you're going to fight? Generally, no. It's, it's like you said, like, um, I think it's more for entertainment and engagement yeah. of, of, of for the viewers. It's like, you know, it's, it's, like, you know, it's, um, it's, it's a way of combat sports trying to get into the market or into the big leagues of say like you know like um football? like soccer yeah, yeah. Football. oh those, those ones you know it's nice it's like you know it makes it really engaging um but like for as a coach and trap i don't see a point of looking at those numbers i can go okay you you gotta try and throw this many in this round for us yeah, to have a chance to win. Like that. yeah yeah, yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's interesting to me to see it as an entertainment product like that so during an, a, an individual fight it can be like the live updates on statistics are part of the narrative that gets constructed. So part of the commentary to keep viewers engaged, bring in that ad revenue. And I imagine also influence the betting because like, and this happens a lot with all kinds of different statistics. You can even see it in people like hungering for updates on COVID numbers. We always feel when we get new information like that, that our understanding of the world is is developed. It's better. Right. But if you've got inaccurate statistics in the sense that a live update on the number of punches thrown or the number of punches landed is inaccurate, right? You just can't keep that up. It feels like new information that gives you a better informed uh, perspective on what who is likely to win. But in reality, it kind of isn't. You would get much more out of watching the fight, I think, and just watching the demeanor of the fighters than you would out of these numbers. But of course, that's not what it feels like when a number pops up on the screen and you get that little rush of dopamine because oh, the information incidentally uh i'm sorry to all the fight fans like all one maybe two of you who actually listen to this tiny podcast because of this episode 
you're nerds. You're getting excited over a lot of numbers if you pay attention to this stuff. <laughs> Welcome to the party. Uh, you can get drinks by the door. Um, how do you bet on a fight mid-fight? If it's talking about get this being used for gambling. Um, well, I don't know if there's mid-fight betting. I know that um, in other games like footy and cricket and things, there's mid-game betting on all kinds of wacky stuff. But if you look, come and look at this afterwards, if you try to... Um, build up in your own understanding a profile of a fighter and then go on bet on a future fight. That's how I imagine that kind of coming into play. Right. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of live updates, Shane, you may know this, but uh, I don't actually know if they have the kind of live betting stuff that you see in other sports. I'm, I'm not much of a gambler myself. Yeah, entirely. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know too uh, much statistics <clears throat> to gamble and not enough about sport. Yeah. <laughs> but like, um, but yeah, like, I, I think he, you can um, the odds change round by round, yeah. And like you know, and like get the sway uh, the the betters to go, you know, which way. And, and like um, and like if you ever go to Thailand, like well, they're, they're starting to get rid of it now. But like back in the day, like Lumpini and things like that. So you got the ring, and then inside that the seated parts where all the the farang, all the all the foreigners, <laughs> <laughs> that's where, where they sit and like you know just more room. And outside is like it's just almost like caged off, and there's this million, there's hundreds, thousands of, of gamblers out uh. there. It's just absolute mayhem. But as and um, that's why they're trying to get rid of the gamblers, especially in Thailand, from there, because like you'll get something where um, the first two rounds not much happens. They're just kind of figuring each other, but it's also for the better sometimes to get their bets in order. Yeah, and then right. they start picking up third and fourth round. And then by then, um, one fighter might be ahead, like on the points. And then you'll see in the last round, nothing will happen. They'll, they'll literally dance in front of each other. They'll uh, just dance, right. sway their arms. Because the bet has already decided who won. <laughs> yeah, so, <right. laughs> yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah, that seems like... Well, it's, it's not quite being paid to throw a fight. But it feels like kind of... Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's certainly. I can, I can certainly see that for the purists, it would be considered a great disruption. Mm. Well, the, the, nowadays they're starting to do it. I'm seeing a lot more now of stadiums, basically referees. Like just recently in this in this last week, two referees gave multiple warning to fighters for not dancing. They're just mm. like you know, and then they called the fight a no contest. They just oh. go, go, they just go. <laughs> okay, cool. No contest. <laughs> uh, I believe that's called fuck around and find out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the, like everything, like especially with gambling in Thailand from there is like, you know, a lot of, a lot of underworld kind of influences mm. as well. So it's like, so a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, I guess, referees and that would be kind of scared to do that. Yeah. I can imagine. Yes. Not unlike <laughs> the unionization efforts, really. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Part of it is also like, commentators a good commentator being able to weave these st live stats updates into their commentary probably makes even a dull fight feel a little bit more exciting and tenuous like i don't watch a hell of a lot of fights sorry shane but uh i just like i can imagine how the that update could be introduced like if you have somebody well rather how i would do it if i was like commentating on this sort of thing is have some notes on a fighter's history say like in the past when they have won or lost fights they've had so many strikes landed up to say round four or whatever percentage of strikes landed up to round four if they have or have not met that threshold i would talk about that and say oh you know they're they're looking really strong they've been able to exceed this threshold that they need to get to and going to the rest of the fight they'll probably be able to continue doing that now that they've gotten to a stride or if they're falling under you can talk about that that as well is that the sort of thing that you see oh so in terms of like the, the commentary using yeah. uh, like these numbers yeah 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 I, I, yeah i see that uh, a bit especially yeah, in, in the high level boxing mm. like they might they might say from here like um even like example like uh someone like terence crawford who's a great fighter recently coming up and um people like floyd mayweather as well like the the commentary will say like you know if if we look at the numbers here, like these boys usually will take like the cup they don't mind losing the first few rounds mm. to to figure out their opponent they're there setting up seeing what their opponent's got let them go back and then they figure it out and then usually they turn it up and they might say so if you haven't got a <clears throat> so past past like a certain amount of rounds that's um these guys switch on 
and they just you know they, they kind of historically sweep those rounds yeah right yeah so you can use yeah definitely use information like that or like you know if, if a guy's a good ko artist in the later rounds to keep excitement um, so ko artist being like he knocks out in the later rounds yeah so yeah, like right. they, they they might like where where it's usually a lot harder thing to do because of fatigue, but there is definitely some guys that kind of use the other person's fatigue to their advantage and gotcha. wait a little bit and then yeah to look for the knockout in the, like maybe in the later half of the fight. Yeah, yeah, right. So these are the sorts of statistics that you get from individual rounds or combined into an overall fight. Now let's have a think about an individual fighter and the stats that get associated with them. You have general physiology stuff, height, weight, age. While the height probably doesn't change a hell of a lot, both age and weight do. Boxstat.co have some really interesting summary stats for fighters. They're also a bit uh, cagey, perhaps, about the details they give. These are very much invented statistics to make it look like they're doing some sort of objective quantitative analysis, when in reality, I'm not sure you could actually construct a valid measure of these things. The first of these that I'm going to talk about is called punching power. What boggles me about this is that it's measured as a percentage. (laughs) For the audio uh, people, this is a, from the web page where they tell you what they do with it, is the calculation of how hard we think this boxer punches. This calculation is made by looking at how this boxer fared against their previous opponents and how tough we deemed that opposition to be. They don't actually tell you everything that goes into this. Uh, Unfortunately, companies are under no obligation to tell me information about their statistics, which is very rude. And when I rule the (laughs) world, they will have to give me that information. The shaking hand meme with Boxstat and the New York Times bestseller list. (laughs) (laughs) Private companies were a mistake, man. (laughs) So the primary metrics that they that Boxstat uses for this are things like fight outcome, previous fight outcome, how long it's been since their last fight, which means, I suppose, how much time they've had to heal, but also how much time they've had to train, weight and age difference, and distance of the fight before any stoppages. Now, I wanted to ask you, Shane, what does stoppage mean here? That could probably go under the TKO kind of right. uh, terminology. So, like, where the, the referee deems the fight to be stopped. Um, it can also be uh, on cuts. Right. Um, and, and when you do, it like, a, a cut as well, you have to... Uh, the difference from it being maybe, like, a no contest to the other guy winning. So, if, if both of their heads clashed from there, right. so, like, incidental headbutt, Mm. Oh, ac- oh, sorry, no, uh, accidental headbutt, I mean. <laughs> accidental-, <laughs> <laughs> accidental headbutt. Um, As and opposed the cut- to I- intentional Liverpool kiss. <laughs> yes, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, a fight can be a no contest there if, if, the, if one fight can't continue because it yeah, wasn't right. like, like they, they, they may may have not <laughs> tried to headbutt him. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of headbutt butts in boxing, trust me, though, okay? Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I, I can see it happening. Yeah. <laughs> opposed, to, opposed to if it was from a punch then that's like the injury thing where it's like the guy yeah. that caused the cut that they, they'll win so that, that's, that's usually a scoring as opposed to an accident yeah yeah so that's how i, I uh, kind of deem like the, the word stoppage in this okay this percentage though i have no idea what it's meant to be a percentage of like i can't for the life of me work out what a hundred percent punching power would mean my best guess is that would indicate you have like a, a one punch man fighter. But <laughs> the numbers that I saw were like 68%, 72% for the uh, Williams and Heard we looked at previously. But those don't seem to indicate that each individual punch has a 68% chance of dropping an opponent. I, I don't understand what this is trying to do. I think that um, this is basically... A, a number that they cook up to make it look like they have a more objective metric of fighter quality than actually is possible to create, which happens all the bloody time with any kind of statistics, because you can invent whatever you want, and then it is up to you to argue that it's useful and valid. This statistic, with all of its problems, gets paired with a estimated past opponent's punch resistance, which is also given as a percentage and makes no goddamn sense. When I tried to find out how this was estimated, the website told me that the text was being revised. 
my guess is that it's an average of the next statistic, this one here, for all this fighter's previous opponents. So the estimated ability to take a punch, which is again given as a percentage, which makes no sense, uh, I'm not convinced that it is all possible to apply a consistent number, as mentioned, to any of this stuff. And I feel like this is another example of what happens when people become convinced that applying a number to something somehow makes it more real, which is the exact opposite of what actually happens when you do that. The final stat is estimated past opponent stopping power. I think that this is the average of this like punching power statistic for everyone somebody has faced in the past. Which, I'm sorry, averaging a meaningless statistic doesn't make it any more meaningful. These kind of averages are equally problematic, equally confusing to anything else that happens for an individual fighter. Yeah, but you had a cool percentage besides the average. <laughs> Listen, this, this is the difference between the people who play it being huge nerds, the actual huge, nerd, huge <laughs> nerds, right? The people who play it being huge nerds get really excited over numbers because there are numbers there. The people who are huge nerds sit there and go, this is fucking meaningless. Why are you doing this? <laughs> and just start bitching about it and then start a podcast so they can bitch about it to an audience. Well, I will say um, I'm an AFL fan and if the scoring system for AFL, because it's one of the most subjectively umpired games in the world, but if the scoring system was that subjective, Victorians would have broken brains more than they already do. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the COVID going around. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the sorts of statistics that we see out of fights. You have individual fight statistics. You have uh, an amalgamation of those that go into building a fighter profile. And you have this bullshit, which is just invented to look fancy. So, because we've gone slightly over time, we're only going to have a real quick mailbag today, but it's a follow-up question from episode 6 that I got from a listener. Episode 6 was about summary statistics, which uh, you may not have the context for, sorry Shane, but I was asked why we use variance, which involves squaring the difference between a value and a mean, rather than the absolute value of that distance, which means you take the distance... And whether it's a negative or a positive, you disregard that, right? So minus 2 becomes 2, minus 10 becomes 10, 10 just stays 10. Given that if you square something, you make it way bigger than the actual number. So if this distance here is 5, when you square it, you get 25, which blows up very rapidly. So the viewer's question was, why do we use the variance based on the square rather than something based on the absolute value? But we do use the absolute value thing, but not very often. It gives us a statistic called the mean absolute deviation, which looks like the sum of all of the distances, and so on up to the last one, and that gets divided by the number of observations. This exists, it's not used very often. Variance gets used more because under some assumptions that you can check, it has really nice mathematical properties that make stuff like hypothesis testing that we talked about last episode a lot easier. There's also a whole bunch of things which use variance as a direct parameter, but are entirely too difficult to define using mean absolute deviation. It's a mathematical convenience, and given how much a pain in the ass doing the maths is in general, we'll take those where we can get them. <laughs> Uh, that's us for today. Shane, thank you so much for being our very first guest. Oh, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me on. Yeah, where can people find you? So you can find me, um, well, me on Instagram, Shane Greenwood 84 um, You can also find my podcast there, uh, Combat Chat Podcast. We release weekly. Um, and also, hey, if you're ever in the area of Sutherland Shire, come visit my gym, Double Dragon Gym. Fantastic. But thank you as well for being here and putting up with me yet again. <laughs> no problem. It's always a pleasure. <laughs> and to our audience, we have a Patreon. We have, in fact, released our very first bonus episode for November at some point this month, which is December. I can't remember exactly when this episode will come out. We'll re record and release another bonus episode and we'll intend to continue that into the foreseeable future. You can also get access to episodes early and background content like scripts and slides will be uploaded there. Thank you both again, and I'll talk to you later. Speak to you then. Bye.